A troll is somebody who misrepresents themselves online and creates a fictitious account in order to post negative reviews about a business or a person or a cause in order to further themselves. In the eyes of Canadian law, it's illegal. It is considered fraud to misrepresent yourself online. So we had to go and find these trolls accounts. Nine trolls to date, where we had to track down the IP address and the MAC address. Basically, we know where you live. Makes no difference where I go. You're the best hometown I know. Hello, Calgary. Hello, Calgary. You know we love you. Makes no difference. The Alberta Advantage is a bi monthly political commentary podcast that offers analysis on Calgarian and Albertan politics from a left wing perspective. This podcast does not represent the views of former mayoral candidate Bill Smith, the Calgary Police Service, or Main Street Research. I'm Joel. I'm the host of the Alberta Advantage. I'm into social theory, philosophy, and geography. Hi, my name is Andrea Sondergaard, and I am a Calgarian interested in grassroots political movements who is currently a contributor on the Alberta Advantage. Uh, I'm Karen. I'm a contributor to the podcast, as well as a graphic designer. My interests are national and provincial politics and social history and labor history. Uh, I'm Levi. I'm a contributor to the Alberta Advantage podcast. Uh, I'm interested in youth organizing, uh, post-secondary policy, and student movements in Canada and Alberta. Hi, I'm William, and I'm a contributor to the Alberta Advantage. Uh, My interests are political organizing, mostly provincial politics, and... Uh, social history and labor history. And my name is Kate. I record, edit, and produce this whole thing. I like most topics, so you'll probably hear me chime in every now and then. For our inaugural episode, we decided to take a look at Calgary's most recent civic election. We're going to look at the mayoral race, the general tone of the election, and then we'll highlight some of the ward and school trustee races that we found the most interesting. Welcome to the Alberta Advantage. Uh, We're here today to discuss Calgary's recent municipal election. Uh, It was one of Calgary's most politically polarizing municipal elections in a long time. Uh, You saw the mobilization of explicitly right-wing partisan endorsements, iconography, attack ads, anonymous political action committees, including Save Calgary and Common Sense Calgary. You also saw the Calgary Flames use the opportunity to weigh in on their proposal to have the public pay for an arena. You had Calgary developers weighing in with lists of candidates that they encouraged their employees to vote for, such as Jay Westman, chairman and CEO of Jamin Built. Overall, it was yeah one of the most interesting elections Calgary has seen. Uh, there was a record advance vote. In the seven days of advance voting, 74,965 ballots were cast, according to unofficial results. Uh, by comparison, in 2013, there were only 22,000 plus that were cast, and in 2010, the advance poll was at 23,000, so more than double, uh, in fact, more than triple the advance polls. Uh, We also saw record voter turnout. Voter turnout uh, was higher than it's been in more than four decades, with 387,306 votes cast by 58.1% of the electorate, according to Elections Calgary. So with that said, uh, I'll open the conversation up to anybody with general comments about Calgary's most recent election and um, the race for mayor. Yeah, no, it's it's just funny to see. Uh, it's funny to see the UCP take this as uh, as a litmus test, I think, for them, and to try to get some of their uh, the old boys' club back in power uh, in the province since they've been almost completely shut out. Uh, uh, it was funny that they they put so much effort and put so many resources towards this election um, because they thought it was. Uh, it was where if they're going to win power, they're going to need to win Calgary, but uh, they didn't put any resources or any uh, any candidates, credible candidates for mayor uh, up in Edmonton because they, uh, I guess they view Edmonton as communist or something. But uh, hmm. uh, no, it was, it, was, it was fascinating to see and it was fascinating to see them put somebody up that was uh, so associated with the downfall of the progressive conservatives just as a party and for them to think that was a winning strategy. So you're referring, of course, to Bill Smith. To Bill Smith, yes. And just for our uh, podcast listeners, right. 
Uh, what's Bill Smith's association with the PC Party? Uh, he was PC president from, I think, 2010 to 2013. And it was during the sort of Stelmac to transition to Allison Redford uh, administrations. And uh, there was a lot of corruption scandals and those sorts of things. It was, it was interesting hearing somebody like Daniel Smith, who's now a prominent radio host in Calgary, talk about how good Bill Smith would be for the city when there are multiple clips of her personally going after him in the legislature uh, during the time because he was sort of the embodiment of the PC corruption at the time. I was just going to say that it was a an election that I was watching super closely because of the uh, international political climate, you know, like uh, ever since Brexit last year. And Trump. Uh, and then, of course, the Trump. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Trump presidency it was you know, on the edge of your seat, like what's going to happen? Just because things uh, seem like they should go a certain way doesn't mean that's going to be how they turn out. And like, there's a populist element that is, you know, angry and um, motivated. And so I think that was something that this uh, election race kind of had um, that previous previous races hadn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had uh, the conservative candidates uh, copying directly the imagery and uh, slogans of the Trump campaign. You'll see uh, make all that Berta great at Ken hats and things as well. <laughs> yeah. So they were definitely playing that up for their base and it wasn't subtle. So this was Nenshi's third mayoral run. Um, And one of Nenshi's major policy shifts has been to reduce the sprawl subsidy, uh, which saw the city take, the the subsidy in the first place saw the city take on costs of water and road infrastructure for suburban development. Uh, The city used to absorb the full cost, and that was reduced reduced to 50% in 2011, and the subsidy fully ended in 2016. And I think this is what was driving a lot of the suburban developers to back Bill Smith, for example, and, and launch this kind of slate against people that don't vote over, overwhelmingly for suburban development. Yeah, although to be fair, we still don't know if they've actually endorsed him because the list, as, oh, yeah. as far right. as I understand, hasn't been released. It won't be released won't until March 1st, March 1st I think, yeah. is the, when he's legally required to. Yeah. Can't mm-hmm. wait for that revelation. So what was Bill Smith's platform? I'm not a head ninja. That's it. Like transit the, is bad, also. Transit, transit is bad, bad. flames sort of. are good. The flames, yeah. The only announcements that I saw him come out with that were maybe even platform related, were immediately called out as extraordinarily damaging to the city, like <laughs> saying that you're going to rethink the, the green line and, and potentially uh, put in jeopardy billions of dollars in other government uh, infrastructure money. In the press over the last day or two, it's been reported that the conservatives may have spent up to a million dollars on the Smith campaign. That seems that seems low to me. Yeah. Yeah. Low, and, Rick McIver spent over a million dollars in 2010 to lose to Nenshi. I want to say that one of the most noticeable things for me about the Bill Smith campaign is I live downtown, so it's mostly apartment buildings, so you don't get yeah. the same lawn sign kind of game you might get in a more suburban division. And you would see Bill Smith signs everywhere in front of apartment buildings, yeah. and you see it, and you're like, that shit was paid for by a landlord. It's not like everyone in the apartment building got together and was like. Bill Smith's our guy. You can yeah. tell that whoever owned that building bought like one of those like big, big signs and put it outside the front. And you could see that everywhere. And I think it's worth noting that Ward 8, which is where downtown is and is where I live, it went overwhelmingly for Nenshi. Despite the fact that if you were to walk through the streets of downtown, you would think these people loved Bill Smith. Interesting. <laughs> so landlords for Bill Smith uh, <laughs> managed to project the kind of overwhelming, at least the appearance of an overwhelming majority yeah, for Bill absolutely. Smith, even though... The numbers were just not there. There's also the issue of list sharing that I found interesting. That I didn't read. Disgusting. Re- yeah, that was very shady. Yeah. So what is it that occurred? Just so on, in the on the municipal level, mm-hmm. you don't get lists. Um, like you have to from political parties. Yeah, you can't you can't get them from political parties. You have to create them yourself. Well, I think the UCP gave it these lists because it wasn't just Bill Smith that had it. Uh, some of the city councilors yeah. yeah. also got it. So in Ward Seven here. Where I live, Margot Aftergood like was blasting through all the um, the people who were on the UCP list who had not signed up for her. So, including uh, people who, who very much supported the incumbent city councilor Drew Farrell, who won in the end, uh, were getting uh, getting emails from Margot Aftergood. And there's no way they could have had that other than that at one point in time they had a PC membership. Yeah, that's interesting then because that means that not only did they have the list, they also had like up to date data on where people live. Because yeah. I only got I only got the Bill Smith stuff. I didn't get anything from the conservative choice in my writing. So yeah. that meant yeah that they're targeting ward by ward. 
So for me, this all goes back to this illusion we have that city politics are nonpartisan, yeah. which I find very frustrating because even though city politics are technically nonpartisan, like neither Mayor Nahim Nenshi, neither Drew Farrell or Evan Woolley or Bill Smith or any of these people technically belong to a political party, they draw on the campaign resources and the apparently the lists, they draw on the same donors, they draw on the same volunteer base, and I feel like there's this massive illusion that city council is free from partisan politics when in reality it's almost less transparent because people aren't honest about where they're drawing their volunteers and their uh, donors and all this sort of stuff from yes and no like i think the issues that affect cities are inherently less partisan than issues affecting provinces and uh you know um federally like i don't think that um municipal issues have the same kind of ideology attached to them necessarily. Like a, what's right for a community, it's what you know benefits the most citizens in a very tangible way um, and costs the least amount. Like those are, it's pretty pragmatic. But I mean, that is an ideology saying that like what we want to have policy wise is what is best for the largest amount of people. Because what Bill Smith was proposing policy wise was not best for the largest amount of people. That's an ideology. Kate, are you suggesting that we're never outside ideology? I will in fact go on the record and say that everything, even city politics, is ideological. <laughs> um, for me, the, the partisan issue when it comes to municipal politics is very interesting because Alberta, and I feel like probably Calgary more so, has this history and tradition of thinking that partisan politics is bad, or politics generally is bad, and politics is merely, merely a sort of like managerial, like technical administrative thing that you just need people to administer. And it, there's kind of this weird history of not fully recognizing or acknowledging that all these decisions are inherently political, they benefit some people and, and work to other people's detriment. And, and not fully politicizing that, I think, is, is just part of the weird history of Calgary. And there are many cases in the municipal election where as a voter I actually think I would have appreciated partisan politics. Uh, the school trustee race in my opinion is a really really great example of that is I would have loved if one of the school trustee candidates in my ward was just affiliated with a party that I support because school trustee candidates in particular go out of their way to obfuscate their actual politics and it makes it very very difficult to tell who to vote for and you see that in the number of people who cast ballots for mayor and councillor and then did not cast ballots for their school trustee. Yeah well this time around it was a little easier to pick who I had to vote for for school trustee because the right went, uh, basically they ran a slate from the right called Students Count which was very uh, opaque about where they were getting all their money. They clearly had a lot of they clearly had a lot of money behind them to do like professional campaigning and materials and mail outs and robocalling. So they did a mail out where uh, they said a vote for us is a vote against the NDP. Um, <laughs> they were run by uh, their whole campaign was run by former Tory bagman uh, Kelly Charles Charlebois Charlebois yeah and. Uh, many of them also had like affiliations with the PCs somehow or the other, and to top it all off, Jason Kenney endorsed the slate. So I'm like, wow, that makes it really easy just to not vote for uh, Lisa Davis in Ward 7, who won in the end. Yeah. Fortunately, Thanks they did not elect enough people to take over uh, the school board in Calgary. They needed four, they ran five, and only three were elected, and there's seven. So I'd like to launch into a discussion of our friend... Uh, Ward Sutherland, who I'm very certain is definitely listening to the podcast, even though he blocked me on Twitter. Friend of the podcast, Ward Sutherland in Ward 1, uh, managed to keep his seat, 59% of the vote. His main competitor, Coral Bliss Taylor, came in with 44% of the vote. For a few minutes uh, on election night, Coral Bliss Taylor actually was ahead because of the polls that were coming in, so that was briefly exciting. Uh, however, we are uh, blessed with Ward Sutherland's presence for another term. Some of my personal favorite moments of Ward Sutherland's include uh, in February of this year, he argued that private golf courses should uh, get help from the province. Uh, obviously, the city is in the middle of an oil downturn, um, and so it makes perfect sense that taxpayer money should get thrown at private golf courses because they have it real tough signing up private memberships and charging private rates for golf courses. Like, it's just nice that somebody finally is, uh, is thinking about the poor, poor private golf course owners. Uh, they've been shut out for so long, and uh, it's nice that uh, uh, Ward finally looked, looked out for them. And ironically, 
government subsidies for private golf courses is the funniest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Golf courses are the ultimate in rich people bullshit. <laughs> and just like, they take up so much water and resources and time. They're just the dumbest thing. And space. Oh man, well, where are you gonna, like, how are you gonna uh, find a way to entice donors? Are you donors? going to collude? Yeah, okay, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so in Ward Sutherland's words, if we don't change it, most of the golf owners are saying in 10 years from now, there will be no courses in the city. Another great moment, and this was during the campaign, was uh, Ward's Johnny Jew from New York quote. I think to anybody who listens to the clip, he's definitely just off the cuff saying Johnny Jew from New York. So like it's casual. a thing he says every day. He claimed he was referring to Jimmy Chu, the Malaysian UK shoe designer. Yeah, the thing about that that was, that was crazy was not only did uh, did this get picked up Almost immediately after he said it, it was on social media, and then a lot of reporters started to see it in the morning, and he didn't come out with a statement until way later in that day, which you know he was just looking for some fucking excuse. In all seriousness, so like, I'm Jewish, I just like, that's a really despicable and disgusting thing to say. And the fact that it came out of his mouth so casually, like he says this all the time, like he thinks like this all the time, is really, really gross to me, and to associate Jewish people with big money with cultural elitism with new york with this sort of like outside of us influence that seeks to kind of undermine what true calgarians think about public art is like Jew. <laughs> incredibly incredibly nefarious and it's a really really gross thing to say not because saying johnny jew from new york is like the worst thing you could possibly say about jewish people but because it taps into this cultural history of anti-semitism that has an extremely dark and ugly past and in my opinion remarks like that are just absolutely beyond the pale yeah definitely 100%. and and he made the remarks in a discussion of public art yeah yeah uh, where he was trying to explain why public art isn't good right now or something to that effect and it's yeah it's, it's so casual it was mm -hmm. yeah it was crazy I, I genuinely believe this is a part of, uh, of a resurgence in conservative talking points and in ideology about ideas of cultural Marxism, which is a very anti-Semitic idea tied to this idea that Jewish people are trying to undermine, quote, Western civilization, unquote, with sort of counterculture ideas. Um, which they associate with everything from homosexuality to public art. And uh, Jason Kenney, for example, he talks about cultural Marxism. And while Jason Kenney, I don't believe, is like a particularly anti-Semitic person, like who has it out for the Jews, he's still dog whistling uh, what is an anti-Semitic concept to large amounts of people on a regular basis. And I think that's a really big resurgence in the conservative project right now. I think it's worthwhile articulating what... <laughs> Ward Sutherland actually said to try to explain it. Um, his exact words were, the point I was hoping to drive home was the importance of utilizing local artists rather than those from abroad. While Sutherland didn't say which Chu from New York he was referencing, that's C-H-O-O -O from New York, <laughs> um, there is a Jimmy Chu who designs women's shoes and lives in the United Kingdom. So that's a direct quote from the story about it. Also, it's pretty damn easy to say what Ward Sutherland apparently wanted to say without being anti-Semitic. Here, I'll do it right now for everyone. Uh, I think it's important that public art prioritizes local designers instead of work from out of the city and out of the country so we can revitalize our local economy and support our local creatives. See, I didn't have to mention Jewish people at all, even a little bit. It's actually wow. extremely easy. You could run for his campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Ward Sutherland, please come on our podcast. And <laughs> also, please let me run your next re-election campaign. Oh, man. And how Ward actually got a seat is very interesting. Ward was elected in 2013 with 39% of the vote. Uh, he won against Chris Harper, who also had 39% of the vote. Ward won, won by 86 votes. That's mere, one tiny stack. Mere days before, um, before the election, Ward posted a baseless news post about sign theft regarding his campaign signs and the possible involvement of an opponent's campaign. Uh, and in the brief 290-word news post, uh, the male campaign worker is described as Harper's partner four times, uh, while another first reference calls him his common-law spouse. So some people have suggested that it was gay-baiting. It was gay-baiting. It was gay baiting, 100%. Uh, I've heard that uh, Ward also went, went around to churches. I've heard that too. And told uh, all the churches that Chris Harper was gay. Chris Harper doesn't make any secret about that. Yeah. But, like, specifically driving home to, like, conservative Christian congregations that you need to vote for him because 
he's not gay, unlike his opponent. Well, and Chris Harper was, um, he was a conservative as well. Yeah. So I think that's what he was, like, that was the definitely the wedge that he, he used to, to drive between, like, if it was, you know, the young conservative who's also gay, by the way, was kind of his whole mm-hmm. approach of it. And that was, it was disgusting and horrible. And in an election that close, like, it's hard to, it's hard to say he won on any other, any other merit. In War II, Joe Magliocca uh, retained his seat with 49% of the vote. Uh, his nearest competitor was Jennifer Winus, who came in with 36% of the vote. Does anybody have any stories, fond memories, there's definitely been some some things that have come out since the end of the election that are that are pretty gross uh, about the campaign and specifically Jennifer Winus's uh, pregnancy. Does anybody know much about the attack ads? Basically, people were insinuating that because of her pregnancy, she would be unable to fulfill her duties as city councilor and that it was in fact selfish of her to run for the position yeah. given that she was pregnant, which is a very disgusting narrative to push about women who are pregnant. Women who are pregnant just like for the record they're still people your brain doesn't like go missing when you become (laughs) pregnant you know like you're perfectly Mm -hmm. capable of being a city councilor Mm -hmm. and in fact the fact that city council has no type of parental leave whether it is maternity or paternity leave is an absolute shame and that's in my opinion definitely one of the reasons we don't see as many women on city council because women in general take the majority of the responsibility for childbearing and child care Yep, mm-hmm. very good points. In Ward 4, beloved Sean Chu held on to his seat. Sean Chu, friend of the podcast, he held on with 48% of the vote. Uh, his challenger, Greg Miller, uh, came in with 41% of the vote. Uh, I was pretty broken up over Greg Miller not getting in because I knew that Greg Miller put in tons and tons of time and energy into running a really, really great campaign and calling Sean Chu on his bullshit. And so it's really unfortunate that it didn't work out for Miller, although I, I hope we see more of Greg Miller in the future. For podcast listeners that are unfamiliar with the glorious Sean Chu, fighter of bike lanes, here's a... I have way too many facts about Sean Chu. He <laughs> says stupid things on Twitter pretty regularly, and so let's just try to run through this list as quickly as possible. In November of 2013, uh, Councillor Sean Chu said he hopes to see adjustments to the lights along Bennington Trail. Quote, you see people rush after the first set of lights, they speed up to try to make the next set of lights, Chu said of that right. <laughs> if they're better synchronized, people know that if you drive the speed limit, you're going to hit a green light. So, you can solve traffic by having more green lights, is my takeaway there, which is just a brilliant... Show me the lie. Wow. Let's show me the lie. Also, <laughs> a lot of traffic lights already are synchronized based on this. Yes. Y- yeah, they're not just like randomly flickering <laughs> like on and off. Um, and it also seems to... To not quite realize that, uh, you know, why are lights red? Well, it's because they're green on the other side. Like, it's just... <laughs> Anyhow, so that... Okay, that's point number one. In January 2014, Jason Markasov tweeted that Sean Chu is suggesting Calgary look into the straddle bus, which is proposed in China. It's pretty wow. Uh, so, for those that aren't familiar, it was this idea of a bus, sort of like an elevated bus that would straddle lanes of traffic so that traffic could flow under it while you had like a bus carrying passengers like above the vehicles underneath. Turns out, uh, we found out this past summer that uh, China's traffic straddling bus is definitely a, a financial scam and is now linked to 32 arrests. So <laughs> I don't know I don't know how you can look at a picture of that and think that's a good idea. That'll work. It's like the that's most insane viable. shit of all time. Yes, yeah. it's completely ridiculous. Um, in May 2014, <laughs> Uh, Calgary Councillor stands by global warming alarmist tweet. Uh, Councillor for Ward 4 appeal- appeared to suggest cold weather is a sign of lack of climate change. Uh, here's, his, here's his quote. Show me the lie. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and, if it's cold, it can't be. And, and for listeners, it's true. his tweets read so much better than they do. Like, you have to see them to believe them because he, he just, like, skips vowels and c- compresses words in a pretty unique way. Uh, I'll do my best to give you sort of an auditory representation. So quiet from global warming alarmists about the ice stuck ship and YYC, I mean in Calgary weather, it's deafening. Is it because the weather's been so freaking cold? I, I just like to say that if I could replicate the way Sean Chu tweeted ironically, I would have like 10 times as many followers. <laughs> I can't even make jokes as funny as Sean Chu actually tweet. In March 2014, Sean Chu apologizes for disrepe- disrespectful profane bike link tweets. He used social media to criticize city transportation engineers' work on the cycle track. 
So he criticized Blanca Brackett, uh, the transportation engineer with the city who had been briefing council on the plan to build a separated bike lane on First Street Southeast. His tweet reads, again, you should read it yourself. It's hard to express um, in an audio form. This is nothing but caps bullshit. 7th Street <laughs> increased to 1,160 cyclists per day. What was she on? The emperor continuously getting new clothes. Another incident in November 2014. This one's for you, Kate. At Shanshu Calgary. Love this quote. The problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, the problem with capitalism is that you eventually run out of other people's labor. And the problem with Margaret Thatcher quotes is that you eventually run out of them because she's fucking dead. <laughs> in May 2015, uh, Ward 4 Councillor Shanshu wrote the following tweet comparing the recent Irish vote to allow same-sex marriage to, quote, that. our own social revolution to screw the downtown businesses. Cycle tracks. Uh, so the again, this is a tweet of his. You should really read it yourself because it's hard to vocalize. Um, congrats, comma no space capitalized Irish's quote social revolution end quote on same sex marriage period <laughs> no space we've our own quote social revolution end quote no space it's called quote screw the DT meaning downtown downtown businesses end quote no space capitalized cycle tracks. Um, There's so much to unpack here. It's almost like a piece of postmodern art. I it's... forgot about it, and I'm upset that I remembered it now. <laughs> like, I told. Oh my goodness. So, like, I guess so. Irish people voting on marriage equality is like cycle tracks, which are bad. Ergo, same-sex marriage is bad. Yes, yes. But also, like, those things aren't alike at all. In July 2016, there was a great story about how Sean Chu is definitely not campaigning by door knocking in other councillors' ward. Uh, he says he's meeting people who will eventually be in his ward, assuming he got reelected, which unfortunately he did, uh, but not everyone agrees. Um, so essentially a, a resident in the ward, which he was not actually in charge of yet, um, ratted him out uh, for door knocking in a ward that wasn't his, uh, and so he got a bit of bad press for that. So yeah, he was... He was giving, campaigning essentially. He was giving them. He was giving them uh, uh, fridge magnets and uh, other things as well, and they were all like uh, city paid for as well. So that was like another. Well, good. That was another home. big part yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know what? Sean Chu sure was campaigning for the election. So my parents live in formerly Ward Seven, now Ward Four, with the new boundary changes. Yeah. And I go over to their place for dinner on Sunday nights. And one day we were sitting down having a lovely Sunday dinner, and we hear a knock on the door. And my mother jokingly says, "Oh, maybe that's Sean Chu." <laughs> and then we open the door, and lo and behold, it is Sean Chu in the flesh. And so my family. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, I know. This, this, is, this, a is, real not story? A, this is not a bit at all. Oh, wow. Um, well, my family, literally, there's six of us, right? So there's me and my three siblings and my parents, and we literally all go to the door like jackals, who have <laughs> sense like blood and a wounded animal. <laughs> We're like, oh, hello, Sean Chu. He gives us, he gives us these fridge magnets. Oh, my really? parents still oh, have really? them on our fridge, oh, so we've got goodness. the fridge magnets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he told us, and I will never forget this, he told us that the reason we couldn't have secondary suites in Calgary is because of the NDP government. Oh, and shut I up. Said, oh. Shut up, shut up. And I said, how? <laughs> like, explain this to me. And you know when people come door knocking and you can see the dawning realization on their face that you're not stupid? And, like, you know what, like, they're talking about. And you they're thinking the of an exit strategy. And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, dear. Yeah. Uh, it ended with Sean Chu going down the stairs like from my parents' house and my dad yelling out of the door, <laughs> I wouldn't vote for you if you were the last person left on earth. <laughs> wow. Kate, a, Kate's dad, come mm. on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay, first-hand account, really good. And That's then really just like the, the content of the first-hand account is also <laughs> supremely good. So please give your parents two thumbs way up. Onwards to Ward 7. So Ward 7 was an interesting one because uh, Drew Farrell was challenged by uh, several candidates, including Margaret Aftergood, uh, Brent Alexander, Dean Braun... Uh, and Merrick Hedgeduck. Uh, Drew ended up getting 41% of the vote. Dean Braun came in at 12%. Brent Alexander came in with 37, almost 38. And Margaret Aftergood came in with uh, about 7% of the vote. Let's talk about Drew, but more specifically, let's talk about some of the opposition faced by Drew. So Drew is facing four these conservative like, candidates. Four <laughs> conservative candidates. Mm -hmm. Frivolous this lawsuits, arguably, and... Um, 
some some pretty like underhanded like at a all Canada's forum there were flyers distributed on people's windshields and stuff like essentially detailing the unproven allegations in the lawsuits. Yeah, so this happens in Ward 7 actually like quite a lot. It's a pretty well-documented election pattern. Drew Farrell is known as being a quote-unquote progressive city councillor. Uh, and every time like three or four quote conservative unquote candidates run against her, they always split the conservative vote. She gets re-elected. She's being re-elected to city council uh, quite a lot at this point. In my opinion, the greatest risk to Councillor Farrell's uh, candidacy this time was sort of a generic change feeling, as we saw encapsulated by the Bill Smith campaign, and that they would go for a candidate like Brent Alexander. Ward 7 voters in general are progressive. Uh, they're not really going to vote for a conservative candidate, but someone like Brent Alexander, who was sort of generically progressive on many issues, I think was like a real risk for council. Yeah, Carroll. but there's a lot of people who live in Ward 7 who are like progressive-minded but also wealthy and don't like high property taxes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because there's a lot of like really nice neighborhoods full of like, you know, million dollar infills. Yeah. So that was sort of Brent, Brent Alexander's appeal is that he's not like a foaming at the mouth conservative but he promises like lower property taxes. Yeah. Um, one thing I'll say about Drew that I, that I love is that so with with Brian Pinkott not running again she even even with with Brian on council like Drew was always sort of the face of like anything to the left on council for yeah. years and years uh, and I just love the fact that since she's won so many times that every single time that she wins there must just be like a group of old white dude conservatives just so mad that she got reelected, and that that gives me some joy that uh, they try so hard to unseat her and they just can't. Uh, right. I want to say that I think Drew Farrell is one of the most consistently maligned uh, councillors yes. on city council, 100%. and like I don't think Drew is perfect politically, and I don't think she has the perfect political record. It bothers me that her opposition to fluoride is based in absolutely no scientific evidence yep. that she didn't make any yep. concerted effort to put affordable housing in the revitalization of the. East Village, yep. but mm -hmm. like overall, she gets so much flack on city council from the conservative press and from conservative candidates and from conservative advocacy groups in this city, despite being a left of center like city candidate. And I think part of that is just sexism. Like, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. because she's a big woman. time. Uh, so, to the conservatives in Ward 7, please keep putting up four candidates every election. It's great and I love it. Moving on to Ward 8. Uh, our friend Evan Woolley came back with a 58% of the vote. Uh, his nearest competitor was Chris Davis, who came in with 32.5% of the vote. So, an overwhelming crushing it for Evan Woolley. This campaign was kind of weird because of the very, very, like, federal conservative style attack ads um, and campaign literature that went out against Ev. Um, they really tried to mobilize the uh, the, I don't know, the conservative brand to... Well, his, uh, Chris Davis, like, his signs, like, were the same sort of graphic design as, like, federal conservatives, weren't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was similar in other cases, but that students count slate, and also one of the candidates in Ward 7, Dean Braun, used the same graphic design. Also, his campaign was targeted by, uh, vandals, essentially people taking out signs. Here's what Chris Davis, uh, put out against Evan Woolley. Uh, high taxes, out of control spending. Voted overwhelmingly to increase taxes on families, put special interests ahead of everyday voters, voted for massive tax hikes on small businesses, voted to spend millions on pet projects, hiking your taxes to spend on special interests. Uh, okay, first of all, the mobilization of the like special interests. What special interests are you like? Also, what interests aren't special? Chris like, Davis no? was also literally like a lawyer for the developers. Like, that guy is the definition of a special interest candidate, and he's, like, claiming people his People with opponent. money don't have special interests. Yeah. Only people without money have special interests. People yeah. with money are just doing politics. Yeah. Aren't, aren't developers just thinking about the every person and doing what's best for everyone? Any other uh, big thinks about Evan Woolley and his crushing of Chris Davis? That was surprisingly good crushing. Like, I figured mm -hmm. it would... He was... I figured it was going to be close for Evan Woolley, or even that he might lose, like, because of the size of the campaign that was mounted against him. Same thing with landlords and businesses, as happened with Bill Smith. Yep. You had landlords and you had businesses putting up Chris Davis signs, where the people who worked in those businesses and the people who actually lived in those homes were supporting Evan Woolley. 
Plus, I think there was, in many cases, in Evan Williams, this is things I heard from people who worked on his campaign, there was also a gender divide in many wealthier neighborhoods where you would find a Chris Davis sign on the lawn and you would talk to people inside and the woman who, women who lived there would be voting for Evan Willey and the men who lived there would be voting for Chris Davis. So, you, so like, I think Chris Davis appeared to have a much bigger campaign than he did because he mobilized people who are more visible in our society, people who own property, people who own businesses, and men, whereas the people who work for a living, the people who rent and women are less visible in society and they were the ones who were supporting Evan Willey, which is why I think it appeared to many of us to be closer than it actually was. In Ward 11, Jeremy Farkas took Brian Pincott's seat. <sighs> Jeremy, spelt, uh, yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy, spelt the G-E-R, J-E-R-O-N-Y, uh, came in with 38% of the vote. Uh, his nearest competitors were Linda Johnson with 22% and Janet Aramenko with 20%. Yeah, really sad to see Brian Pincott uh, go. Obviously, he wasn't running, but it's uh, extra sad to see Jeremy come in and replace him. Any fun stories, memories? He likes the idea of politics. He wants to live action role play as a politician for his job. He's one of those people who I feel like saw too much like political drama in the early 2000s, but like that's what he thinks politics is like and he thinks it looks like cool and kind of fun. So he's getting involved in politics. It's so wildly sort of vapid and devoid of any actual ideology or Meaning, but he is super right wing. Oh, you know what? That's fair. Uh, I shouldn't he, mistake bad like, ideology. He, he's, for the no cla- ideology. he's the classic like conservative flunky who fails upwards, where you just like basically like have the right political position in this city, and you can just like get a city cure at the Manning Center, and then like get that push to get you into like yeah, city but council. I almost, I almost feel like if Jeremy Farkas like lived in a different city, he would have different politics. Like I feel like he would yeah. be center left if he I lived in a that. different city. Yeah. I think he's conservative politics because he wants to get elected in Calgary, and it's a quote conservative city unquote. Yeah, I think he made a calculation and decided, oh, these are the kinds of politics I need to get elected, and that's what. So I'll check those boxes. He's uh, yeah, he's 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 an opportunist at his core. Um, but one thing to say about him that we should keep in mind is that like there are conservatives on council that like. Like guys like Ray Jones, which they don't really like have an agenda and they just kind of, they're there, like whatever. They'll vote against things every once in a while. But like Jeremy Farkas has some like damaging ideas and he's got some damaging promises that he's made and that he's doubled down on since he's been elected, like stopping the Southwest BRT, which I don't think like the ways that he's talked about stopping it are are largely like they're going to be ineffective and it's not how city council works. But just the idea that somebody that represents a large portion of where the Southwest BRT is, is vehemently against it is... Damaging. It's gonna be very damaging for people who want to get to Rocky View Mountain Hospital. I uh, want to get to Mount Royal University and those sorts of things. So he's got that extra flair of dangerousness to his ideas, if not in his demeanor. And that's something that uh, will be obviously, I think, a, a defining part of the early city count, like city council's early deliberations and things. Is is guys like him and their uh, uh, opposition to things like this. Some other fun facts about Jeremy. He claimed that people who did not comply with the new green bins could go to jail, which of course is not true. He said stuff like ideology has no place in Calgary City Council, which is the uh, most hypocritical thing I've yeah, ever heard. Yeah, but then he, life. he, he, had, you know, very explicitly designed all his lawn signs to look identical to um, the like dark navy blue background with white text on top of it, saying like, you know, with conservative branding matching the federal conservative party. Also, he literally worked for the Manning Center. I'll be int- I'm very interested to see what Jeremy ends up producing on council. His sort of like full-throated opposition to the BRT project in the Southwest is, it might end up being like a, Sean Ch- where Sean Ch- Chu ends up like yeah. wanting to die on the cycle tracks hill. Jeremy Farkas might try to die on this sort of uh, BRT opposition hill. And it's gonna it's gonna be ridiculous. He's already promising to his voters that he'll he'll oppose it however he can. However, the project is already ongoing, so there's no way to stop it unless you the want to shovels in the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the shovels in the ground right yeah. now. I mean, it w- it also similar to Sean Chu, kind of the effect of just totally isolating him on the council. Next, let's talk about the school trustee elections. A slate ran. The Students Count Slate ran, endorsed by Jason Kenney, or if not endorsed, supported by Jason Kenney. Oh, he endorsed them. In wards 5 and 10, essentially, this one was interesting because one of the Kenney uh, slash Students Count Slate candidates 
uh, Bianca Smetek Smetek was originally with the students council slate and then people dug up old tweets of hers she was she was like on twitter like in huge Kenny attack dog like yeah. going after anyone who criticized Kenny um yeah. Also, when she got dropped off that slate, like, it was done, like, they completely scrubbed any reference to her. Oh, she got erased from the student's account? Yeah, and yeah. they didn't even really issue a statement yeah. about why she was gone. Just, just, like, took her off there. And But her, like, platform was just basically the student's count slate yeah. platform. Also, with an extra bit about, like, students should be made to learn English. Um, and just speaking about the Kenny connection as well, she introduced Kenny uh, at, the, at the PC convention. Uh, at the PC leadership convention, so she was the one who introduced them as well. So, yeah, there's that link as well. Uh, so there, yeah, there were some 2017 tweets uh, that were just like her supporting Kenny or whatever. But uh, Crack Max, famed Crack Max account from Twitter, uh, dug up <laughs> dug up a tweet in which Bianca apparently says, "Feminists like all of you are ruining society. Shut the fuck up and don't read my tweets. Stay in the kitchen." Um, oh, I didn't know about that one. Yeah, that mm-hmm. one's from January 2013. Uh, that got screen capped. I really hope that's not a completely photoshopped tweet that I'm just... Uh, putting just but trusting Crack Max. Yeah, I'm trusting Crack Max here. And then, you know, you have tweets from Jason Kenney uh, all the way in May saying, like, Congra- congratulations to Bianca Smetikek on seeking election to YYC School Board, a strong principled voice for parents. I despise Crack Max. Yeah. yeah, she's pretty awful. She's actually specifically stated she would like never support the NDP either. This is like this is a bit of an aside, but Crack Max belongs to a category of, uh, as they would say, YYC boosters yes. that mm-hmm. care yes. about promoting the image of the city for business interests, but also like do PR for the Calgary police and hate homeless people and like things that actually help poor and working class people. We should call it Crack Max, which is like a specific reference to a certain Max convenience store downtown that is known to be... It's the Max by my apartment building. Yeah, Yeah. it's like a couple blocks away from me. Yeah, Yeah. it used to be near where I worked. And like, it's like basically referring to it as like a, a, like a place where homeless people hang out and do drugs. Yeah, it's just like, there is this insufferable class of like boosters that uh, care about how Calgary is great for foodies, but also love the police. And they're some of the most insufferable people alive. Mm. Agreed. Crack Max, if you're listening, you should get better politics. Crack Max, <laughs> read the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> yeah, we'll be an exam next podcast. Yeah. Uh, in Ward 6 and 7, uh, Lisa Davis got in. Lisa Davis was, again, part of the Students Count slate. She got in with 56% of the vote, whereas Patricia Bolger had 43.6%. So to sum up uh, the balance of power on council, uh, we've got Mayor Nenshi, who we could say is uh, progressive. I, I dislike the word progressive, but I think it's the best word for like candidates who are... Progressive is a great word to describe many city council candidates in Calgary because they like bike lanes and they'll look into new public transit projects, but they're not going to aggressively push things like rent control or affordable housing yeah. units or a massive expansion yeah. of our a public transit infrastructure. 100%. They are going to make small tweaks to the status quo. Good so, tweaks, I want to be clear about that, but they're not going to radically change things. So maybe a fair term what would be like, I don't know, like a kind of liberal, but again, Saying liberal in Calgary has a whole different connotation. So let's stick with progressive. We've got Mayor Nenshi, definitely progressive vote. Uh, in Ward 1, you've got Ward Sutherland, who I'm just going to say is a reactionary. Ward 2, you've got Joe Maglioka, who's a reactionary. Ward 3, you've got Jody Gondak, who we're not sure of yet. We'll see how she votes, but she's got a planning background, kind of a Nenshi policy influence, uh, but was also endorsed by uh, the Westman list. So who knows if she is in the sort of developer slate or not. Ward 4, Sean Chu, definitely reactionary. And a cop. You've got George Holal in uh, Ward 6, who we don't know yet. We'll have to see how he votes. Uh, talked about transparency, fiscal responsibility, and diversity. Drew Farrell is progressive in Ward 7. Evan Woolley, progressive in Ward 8. Uh, young Carl Carra, progressive in Ward 9. Ray Jones, uh, Ward 10, uh, mild reactionary, perhaps. Uh, Jeremy Farkas in Ward 11, definitely a reactionary. Shane Keating in Ward 12, a mild reactionary perhaps. Dan Collier Urquhart depends. Huge question mark. Just question mark, question mark, question mark. Depends how things are that day. And Peter DeMong in Ward 14, a uh, reactionary. So we've got three solid progressives, including the mayor. Oh, yeah, so including the mayor, we've got four progressive votes. And then we've got five definitely reactionary votes. 
and then we've got four question marks. More than that, one, two, three, four, five question marks. So, who knows what happens to the council. Our theme music is from a vintage Hello Calgary ad, and our cold open is the audio from a YouTube video posted by former Ward 7 candidate Marek Hayduke. We'll be back in two weeks with our analysis and commentary of the currently ongoing UCP leadership election. Until then, stay warm out there, Calgary.